All right, welcome everyone. We are uh, here at the Flow Shala and we have a guest presenter, Dr. Emily Spleichel, who is the founder of Naboso Technology Training Max. We um, are a Naboso powered studio here at Flow Shala. We love training with these mats because it wakes up the smaller proprioceptors in our feet when we train and we do a lot of barefoot training here. Um, and we are super honored to have Dr. Emily um, here presenting. And um, just a quick little tutorial on Zoom. If you're not familiar with Zoom, if you want to pin the speaker, like if you want to pin me or Emily when we're speaking, just go ahead and hover your cursor over us and you can just hit double click or pin, pin video and that will make it the biggest screen. If you want to see everyone else, you can go to gallery view on the top right or swipe right and that'll be gallery view. Um, all right, so I would love to hear before we get started, what drew you to the workshop? What do you guys want to learn? Popcorn style, let's hear from like three to five people. What, what drew you to show up on 10 o'clock on a Friday to learn about feet and gut biodome? <laughs> well, I really love using the mats at Flo Shala and um, barefoot training is always one of my favorite. Also, I, um, I have an earthing sheet and I thought I read something about earthing. And I don't use it very often. I have read a little bit about it, but I don't know too much about it. So I thought I might learn about that. Great, awesome, cool, thanks Nancy. Who else? Well, I wanna learn more about the gut biodome because I know it is such a hot topic right now and it's so interesting how the gut's now just seen as the second brain. Um, and so any information that I can absorb on that is gonna be super, super useful. Thanks Elise. Elise is our studio manager here at the Flow Shala and she, um, she and I are working on a big nutrition lot, so this is perfect timing um, to integrate um, ancestral health into um, this talk. So super stoked. Cool. So well, this is, this is a, a cool thing for me because, you know, I just joined training with you um, a few weeks ago, but I used to work at a barefoot studio in Bloomington, and I've been following Dr. Emily since I was, um, I became a willpower instructor. So um, this kind of triangulation of these disciplines feels like I really made the right choice and I'm on the right path in terms of my education. And that's why I'm here. I'm trying to become a better teacher. And um, I just put up a big batch of kombucha the other day and it's super delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So, made it for my gut. <laughs> awesome. Does anybody else have anything they want to share about what drew them here? Yeah, I um, I did a lot of experimentation with uh, barefoot stuff several years ago, uh, five toes, minimalist shoes. Um, so that's all fascinating to me. Definitely interested in learning more about that. And then furthermore, I do a lot of home fermenting. I spent the last year in Costa Rica learning a lot about uh, fermentation and preservation of foods. And so um, being that that's a everyday part of my life, um, I would like to just deepen my knowledge around it. Beautiful. Love it. <laughs> yeah, rock the flow shower swag. Me too. <laughs> Gotta send Dr. Emily over tank that. So guys, <laughs> let's go ahead and mute our mics so that there's no distracting sound. And if you explore on the bottom part of this, there's a little chat bar and I'm gonna click my chat. And you'll notice you can ask questions. So let's say somebody's uh, talking and presenting, they're, at, they're speaking about something maybe not quite fully understand and you wanna ask a question, go ahead and type it in the chat bar there. And then we can also use that to share useful links, such as um, Dr. Emily has tons of really cool sites with awesome education, which we'll be talking about as well. All right, so we're all muted. Get your notepads ready. Prepare to learn and think about your learning objective and how you can facilitate that learning experience today. Be present with yourself, ask questions, um, engage, and we'll have some time for Q&A as well. So um, I'd love to introduce Dr. Emily. She is the founder, like I said, of Nabosa Technology. She's also the founder of Evidence-Based Fitness Academy, which is uh, an organization that te she teaches all around the world uh, to trainers, to physical therapists, uh, to health practitioners. So she's really a wealth of information and knowledge. And one thing that I really appreciate with, about working with Dr. Emily is that she'll 
she's always like one step ahead of the curve in topics that are of interest in health and wellness. So she'll take a topic like interoception, for example, uh, two years ago when I met her, or I've known her for a bit through the Rad Roller Company. Uh, but two years ago, I got the honor to teach at her Barefoot Training Summit. And I remember um, she was really big into interoception. And you may or may not know what that is, but she'll take a topic and then she'll fully, fully um, research it, white paper research it, present it, and give you a lot of really practical information about it. So super excited to, uh, to hear your presentation today. Um, and I guess I should just give you the floor, Dr. Emily, here we go. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks for having brunch with me. I don't have a mimosa <laughs> for the brunch, but you know, it's okay. Um, but yeah, super stoked to share some information about barefoot, earthing, gut, interoception. Um, real quick about my background, because that helps a little bit as far as laying the foundation of why I explore everything the way I do is how Summer had said, um, I am a podiatrist. So I'm a, a foot specialist, but I actually look at myself much more as a movement specialist. Um, I have a master's in human movement. And um, because everything affects movement and your body is so integrated that I actually don't treat a lot of foot specific issues. I treat primarily complex movement dysfunction and chronic pain. Um, so in my practice, uh, I started seeing this trend in patients holding on to their movement disorder or um, being truly identified by their chronic pain and saw this complexity of emotional integration in medical presentation. And to me, it was just very fascinating on the mind-body connections and the somatic influences of um, the human body. And a lot of those are kind of medical mysteries in a sense. They become kind of catch-alls or they're, um, confusing if you look at the human body to Western medicine, which means if something's not showing up on an MRI or a CT or an X-ray, then the Western, classic Western medicine uh, doctor will just be like, I don't know, let's call it idiopathic or call it somatic, and I don't know what to do for you, so that's it. Um, so it, it started kind of leading me down this path of exploring things like um, alternative health, uh, infrared saunas and gut biome and the power of emotions and stress levels and things like that. Um, so my practice is very non-traditional, which also leads me to barefoot <laughs> and the world of barefoot is in my practice and in my education and in my books and everything I speak about is, um, uh, sorry, real quick, idiopathic versus somatic. So a lot of idiopathic, idiopathic is kind of a, a catch-all phrase of you don't know what the diagnosis is. So depending on the specialty, it'll either be called, uh, I see a lot of idiopathic neuropathy in my office, where if it just suddenly out of nowhere, you're getting chronic pain, nerve pain, burning, uh, different sensations in let's say one foot, and you do the workup of all the other neuropathies that exist, EMG, NCBs, et cetera, and all of it comes back as negative, 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 you could either call it an idiopathic neuropathy or technically it could be somatic as well. So they kind of interchange and psychogenic is another word that some people will use or functional. So now a lot of people are calling them that would be a functional neuropathy is another way that you, you could hear it. Um, so great question on that. Um, my, my practice, being a podiatrist, how I first started getting into integrative, holistic, alternative approaches has to do with natural foot function. Uh, being in fitness for 20 years, I've always questioned footwear, restrictive footwear. I was a barefoot athlete. Um, so I always knew there was this optimization to taking away shoes, but the further I delved into it and truly looked at it from a neuroscience perspective, I now see the foot as a very powerful sensory gateway into the entire nervous system with the end goal of movement, because I'm a movement specialist. So if you can optimize movement in a client, in yourself or in a patient by upregulating the sensory input and the sensory brain foot connection, you get 
quite profound changes in that individual. Um, I started seeing rehab patterns in stroke patients when they started integrating foot activation, barefoot activation, sensory input through the feet that you would see stroke rehab accelerate so much faster by essentially training the nervous system the way in which it was shaped. Um, There's a question that popped up that I didn't read, so I apologize if that was a question. Um, now, when you think of the, the foot and what's so powerful about it is that the only contact point between the body and the ground is the foot. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for why there's so many special nerves in the bottom of the feet is that's essentially how we are regulating, interpreting, and modifying each step that we take. So if you are wearing shoes or you have socks or there's any sort of barrier between the nerves in the feet and the ground, you lose that ability to continuously modify and regulate your loading response and your controlled movement pattern. Um, so I try to use it as um, the regulator of the discrete subtleties in movement. If you think of a high performing athlete, that's huge because top level Olympic level athletes, it's subtleties of the control of the nervous system that is a matter of first or second place. Or in someone who has a chronic neurological condition, that's where you actually get profound changes. Let's talk about the nerves in the bottom of the feet. They are called mechanoceptors, not proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are your muscle spindles and your GTOs. They're what sit within a joint capsule. The nerves in the skin in the bottom of the feet and the palm of the hand, mechanoceptors, are sensitive to different stimulation. Four things in particular. Texture, which is what Naboso is based off of. Vibration, which is what ground reaction forces are. Of course, there's pressure and then skin stretch. So when you're thinking of how do I optimize the input from the feet, that's what you want to be thinking about going after. Um, now, 70% of the nerves in the bottom of the feet are sensitive to vibration. 70%. Vibration are again ground reaction forces, impact forces. So every step you take creates vibrational forces that stimulates the nerves in the bottom of the feet. We use vibration to know how hard we're striking the ground, but we also use vibration to maintain balance. So if you start to disconnect vibration from the skin in the bottom of the feet, that's one of the biggest contributors to sway and fall risk with age. So thinking of, let's say I had a, a concussion and now my walking is a little bit uh, thrown off because of a neurological injury, I have to reconnect to how I maintain dynamic balance. You want to tell yourself, let me, let me think of all the ways I can upregulate sensory input specifically through the bottom of the feet to help these individuals maintain balance. That's where and why we developed the Naboso insoles, which are two-point discrimination textured insoles. Um, shoot, if you can see, this is from my shoes, so it's dirty, I apologize. But there's little pyramids across it, if you can see, right? Mm -hmm. So the pyramids of the Naboso products is similar to Braille. So the specificity of Braille, if you've ever wondered, well, how does Braille work? You probably didn't ask yourself that, <laughs> but the the height and the distance of those dots is very specific. The shape and the height and the distance between the pyramids on the Naboso products is very specific. So you might ask yourself, um, if you go to the Naboso website or to our YouTube channel, Naboso website is nabosotechnology.com and you will see videos of people before and after with Parkinson's. They're walking without Naboso insoles, they put in the insoles, and now they're running, which people will be like, what the hell? Like, I'm calling bullshit on that. This is like snake oil, but it's not. What you wanna ask yourself is, how come that doesn't happen with someone with Parkinson's or a stroke just walks barefoot, right? Like, cause barefoot you're accessing the nerves, but not in a specific way. So 
you take an individual with Parkinson's, put their shoes on, they walk in a classic Parkinson's way. You take off the shoes, maybe they get a little bit of a difference, but not what you're seeing on these videos. Then you add the Naboso texture, two-point discrimination, which is very specific, and then you're seeing a change. So it's the specificity that is very important. So it's actually not pressure. That's a, it's a good question or point. It's actually not pressure. It's two-point discrimination, which is different. The two-point discrimination nerve in the bottom of the feet is called an SA1 Merkel disc. You don't have to memorize that, but it's the most superficial nerve in the bottom of the feet. It is sensitive to two-point discrimination. That's a huge, very important, subtle, discrete differentiator that you need. And that's how you manipulate objects is through the finite differentiation of textures and points. Um, pressure is tied into it, yes, but it's not just pressure because pressure is more of a uh, grosser. It's a larger, it's as finite. Um, but that was a great point that was brought up as far as pressure. Um, so now, if you're trying to access the skin on the bottom of the feet, you want to start asking yourself, what surfaces am I training on? Every surface vibrates differently. Every surface has a different hardness or what's called a durometer. So the harder the surface, classically, the higher the proprioceptive input. So I want you to compare uh, like a wrestling mat to a uh, hardwood floor. So those two surfaces, or even the rubber flooring of most commercial gyms or PT facilities, right? So you have three different surfaces, essentially. The hardwood floor, which is a natural material, has the most symbiotic or uh, harmonic relationship with our nervous system. When you strike a surface, you want to think you're striking the surface, it has to vibrate. The surface has to vibrate and you vibrate. So you get this kind of symbiotic reverberation between the two uh, objects. You, your body, your foot, and then the surface or the wood. Now, if you go towards um, like a wrestling mat, you're gonna strike the mat, it's soft, so there's a damping. So you don't get that same vibration kind of dance between you and the surface. It's very difficult to move efficiently and optimize movement when you are on softer surfaces, such as let's say a wrestling mat, right? Um, and then the same thing when you look at rubber flooring, the flooring of commercial facilities is very thick, like hot, the highest quality rubber flooring that you can get is a very thick material that's designed to damp or absorb excess vibration from concrete because that's the flooring that a lot of these uh, rubber facilities are, are based on. Concrete does not vibrate, which means that when you strike the surface, you strike concrete, it does not vibrate. You get a back reverberation of all of those vibrations. Now, if you're curious and if anyone's like, what? I want to I wanna see more. I want to see the signs. You just email me and I've spent hours and hours and hours reading every type of research article that is out there. Um, so I read a research article, construction research, <laughs> and they do studies around concrete and how thick the concrete needs to be and how they actually mix the concrete so it blocks all vibration. Because vibration, if you're in an apartment high rise, is sound. You don't wanna hear your neighbors. You don't wanna hear the people above you. So they have tested how thick do I need to make the concrete so that you don't hear neighbors above, below, to the side, yeah? But not thinking that the thicker the vibration or the thicker the concrete, you've just made it um, more stressful to the natural physiology of the body. That's partly why people who stand on their feet all day on concrete get plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis at very high rates. Teachers, police officers, all these amazing doctors and nurses that are helping us right now, TSA employees, all of these have been my patients and have had awful bouts of plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis because they're standing 
on unnatural surfaces, which is concrete. So try to look beyond um, just, I, okay, I need to get my clients barefoot, but now once they're barefoot, what surfaces am I going to train on? That, that would be your next level. How do you optimize feedback from the feet by modifying surfaces? Best is natural. Trail, trail running, right? The earth, it vibrates. Wood, natural, it vibrates. Um, indoor tracks. Indoor tracks are actually tuned, kind of quoting tuned, to the vibrational frequency of your lower leg muscles. So you will actually see a lot of track athletes will break their personal records on indoor tracks. You always get the fastest, most efficient running on an indoor track that is tuned because it's the most efficient. Um, and then the Naboso surface has two point discrimination. Whole body vibration platforms are amazing. I use those in my office a lot for, for patients and individuals. It stimulates the nervous system. It also stimulates uh, insulin like growth factor, which is I'm just quoting growth hormone, it's easier to explain it that way, which stimulates tendons and bone. So it's the growth hormone for tendons and bone. Um, so if you're thinking as we get older, osteopenia, osteoporosis, risk factors, vibration stimulates the insulin-like growth factor protect your bones. Um, that's why they say do weight-bearing activity to build your bone density. Um, so that's a little bit as far as the proper, not proprioceptors, the mechanoceptors and the nerves in the bottom of the feet, how you can use it, how you can optimize it. Last thing I will add to that is the peak sensitivity of these nerves in your feet is age 40. By the time you are 70, you need twice as much stimulation to create the same response. You add in something like neuropathy. If you have two clients, both of them have diabetes, they're exact same age, one has diabetes with neuropathy, so they can't feel their feet. The other one, diabetes, no neuropathy. The one with neuropathy, diabetes, same age, boom, 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 15 times greater fall risk. 15 times. That is huge. There are 20 million adults in the U.S. that have neuropathy. And just to put it in perspective, the U.S. healthcare system spends $50 billion dollars on falls every year. That's huge, huge. And if people could feel their feet more, that's a huge reduction of these falls or a contributor to these falls. Okay, other questions on that? I like the music. <laughs> So a couple of people in here are actually physical therapists. Emily that just joined as a physical therapist. Yeah, do you wanna take time for Q&A in between your present presenting? Because I know you're, you're definitely presenting on a lot of really heady topics and I know Ryan's <laughs> writing notes. We will be recording this if you wanna like go back. Uh, but does, any, does anybody have, do you want, inner, do you want um, engagement or do you kind of want to present it? How do you want, how do you want to do it, Emily? Or Dr. Emily? Um, yes, yeah, so let me, do you want me to go through here, idiopathic versus somatic, texture, skin stretch, but, oh, sorry, texture, skin stretch, vibration, and then pressure. Oh, sorry, Sean, thank you for answering that. Um, gravel trails and barefoot, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Earthquake mitigation, yes, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> yes, the concrete. Yeah, if people have questions, should they just write them? Yeah, just write if, questions. If they want, or they could um, speak it as well, whichever is easier. I know I, we like the engagement. Um, so if you're thinking of your question, I will then just add on what Ryan added, which is great that concrete <laughs> reduces the earthquake risk because of damping the vibration. So yes, that's <laughs> another asset to the, to the concrete. Um, there was uh, the comment as far as trail and barefoot and gravel and kind of things like that. What that does spur to mind is that um, if you go running, now I know not everyone is, is a runner in here, but it can give you an example of the power of potential barefoot movement, is barefoot running or minimal shoe running actually stimulates your brain and there's higher cognitive uh, stimulation or associations after running minimal versus shod, and it has to do with the heightened awareness. 
So if you do 30 minutes of running in regular sneakers and you're like, whatever, and you're disconnected and you're kind of zoning out, or you're running in minimal shoes, you know you have to just be more cognizant of where your foot placement is and where you're running and things like that. They show that there's a higher cognitive stimulus after running minimal versus shod. Um, so you could say, okay, that's either really cool or the way that I used to use that information when I was in school is that you, you get a similar cognitive stimulus after doing exercise. So I would go to the gym, exercise, and then I would study. So you can kind of like use these as hacks that if you have to study for something or you need to write or you're doing something that has high cognitive um, uh, demands, then you could say, I'm going to go for a run first in my barefoot shoes or my minimal shoes. And then I'm going to actually have a higher uh, attention, memory, cognitive performance status post that, um, which is interesting. That's what that kind of brought to mind. Any questions? Okay, I have a question. <laughs> Um, so we do a lot of barefoot training here. We alternate between um, using the mats and we also have zebra floor. I don't know if you're familiar with the zebra. It's kind of a, it's not quite the marsh or it's like, it's like a harder surface than traditional wrestling floors. Okay. My question is about, um, I guess like spatial awareness and training because yoga mats kind of confine you to a restricted space. Um, do you have any feedback on barefoot training as it pertains to like moving in um, all different planes? Uh, yes. Yeah. So the, the other reason why I like barefoot training in different planes, um, stepping over things, walk on stones, go across a beam, you know, be like super creative in the environment and the directionality and the variability of the stimulus is that you're also trying to build kinesthetic awareness. So a lot of injuries, even like simple ankle sprains is that the kinesthetic awareness or the trigger to the corrective mechanism is delayed in a lot of people, um, which means, and I often say that you can only stabilize a joint, like, like we all just don't want to get hurt and we want to be badasses. So that means you need a low injury risk and a high performance. That's ultimately what everybody wants. So your ability to be a badass or not be injured is directly related to how quickly and efficiently you can stabilize your body or you can control your center of gravity or you can control each joint locally. Now, you can only control each joint locally or your center of gravity or your body as quickly as you can detect a shift in the joint, in the center of gravity or in your body. That's the limiting factor. So you want to ask yourself, how can I detect a shift in my joint faster? In the ankle, the nerves in the bottom of the feet stimulate the nervous system faster than the nerves outside in the ankle. So your ankle is controlled by what's called perineal reaction time, where there's essentially the muscle spindles and the GTO and the tendons along the outside of your ankle. And every time you're about to sprain your ankle, you do a stretch reflex, which triggers that reaction time. And then your perineals, which are on the side of your lower leg, engage it, whoop, you correct yourself out of it, right? It, it pulls you into an E version and you correct. Um, if you compare that strategy to the response of the nerves in the bottom of the feet, sensing uh, a shift in pressure or a shift in texture detection, you'll actually get a faster response through the skin in the bottom of the feet than perineal reaction time. So I use barefoot training in all different modalities across beams, on pebbles, jumping, box jumps, turns, whatever, be creative to build that kinesthetic awareness and that faster feedback to the nervous system so that they can sense a shift in their joint or their body faster. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> cool thank you so much that helped a lot does anybody else have questions they want to ask feel free to unmute your video so we can see your beautiful faces you know it strikes me that with what you just said there doc that um that uh, when you're wearing shoes i have noticed a real propensity for shoes with really thick soles um mm -hmm. for causing injuries in myself i have kind of 
always called it weak ankles. It's kind of a thing in my family. My sister rolls her ankles a lot. I roll my ankles a lot. My parents do. Um, and um, I noticed that when I started going to minimalist shoes, uh, lower profile soles, um, that, that, I, that that just stopped happening completely. Um, and I think uh, something I'd like to know, something that I've kind of hypothesized as part of the answer to that question has to do with the lengthening of the lever arm between your ankle rotation point and the point on the ground. So like if our feet have evolved to have, you know, that much space between, you know, your ankle and the bottom of your foot, and now you've added another inch onto that or something with a padding, that that lever arm increases, you have more leverage on that joint. Is that an accurate way of perceiving why somebody might be, um, uh, more prone to rolling their ankles or more prone to injury uh, because of our footwear that we use? Yes, 100%. So you're, on, you're essentially heightened. You're not to the height of like high heels, but you're, you are changing the lever arm and the physics of how fast you can create torque around an ankle to correct with that heel height, 100%. The cushion of the shoe creates a disconnect. So maybe you're not sensing that shift as fast, yes. And then the third is that your, uh, the time to when it's actually triggered gets pushed out a little bit further again because of that lever arm. So it's length tension relationship, it's lever arm, it's time to the trigger, and then it's the disconnect of that sensory input. So it's a lot. Um, if you track athletic injury rates, foot and ankle, you see much higher rates in shod athletes versus barefoot athletes. Um, you actually see differences in foot and ankle mechanics where more bare, barefoot athletes control the subtleties of the foot in a sense. Think of like a, a free running or um, a parkour and people who do that minimal, they're just like little animals that are, you know, accordions rolling back and forth. Whereas like a basketball player is like the foot is a block or a soccer player or a football player the foot is thought of as just an extension of the ankle, not the fact that there's all these joints that are very dexterous. Um, so yes, your, your assumptions are correct. Yeah, that makes sense. The idea that, that the foam then would be also delaying the perception of the nerves in your foot that would allow you to adjust in time to prevent injury. And that, yep. that, make, that totally clicks for me, yeah. Yep. Add on to that one next step to certain individuals that have ligament laxity. If you have ligament laxity, your time to trigger gets pushed out even further. So um, if you look at injury rates in certain sports, it is, it is always when it's like the fourth quarter or it's the last run on the ski slope or it's the last inning or it's, you know, you're, it's already when you're, uh, pushed out further and the time to react gets a little bit more delayed. Um, so that's something that you want to factor in as well. I did a webinar and a little clip that's on our YouTube channel on ehlers Danlos, hypermobility, local um, ligament laxity, and the time to trigger in any of those conditions is pushed back. Or if you have a torn ligament, obviously you're not getting an proprioceptive stimulus. If you sprained your ankle before, and you've actually torn or partially torn some of those ligaments, you've now delayed or interrupted the proprioceptive trigger from that connective tissue, which is why I also rely, or another reason why I rely on the skin in the bottom of the feet. Good. Any other questions? Then we can talk about interoception, which I love talking about, or gut bio, whenever. Whichever. I have a um, bout of vertigo and I've yep. never actually thought of my feet as a connection between my vertigo. Is that something that I should look at? Yes. So when you think of how we maintain balance or what, what potentially could affect your balance, it is, there's four things. It's the skin in the bottom of the feet, the skin of your hands the joints. So your joint proprioceptor. So the capsule stretch, Third is your ears, meaning inner ears, um, the vestibular system, the way that the canals work. And then four would be your eyes. So let's say you have vertigo. Uh, uh, sorry, let me go back one, sorry. So those are your four input systems. 
if you have a deficit, an injury, or a delay in any of those four, your nervous system makes up the difference by over-recruiting the others or accessing it, okay? So you could say, um, I have, I don't know, cataracts, so I can't see as well, right? So that took away some of the vision. So I'm going to then upregulate one of these other three. So that's where doing barefoot movement, using the Naboso insoles, you're trying to upregulate the others, um, could be a mechanism. Vertigo, vestibular issues, actually hearing loss. We did a research study with Naboso, and we saw a lot of um, people with unilateral hearing loss. So they lost their hearing in, uh, let's say, their right ear, had a much higher fall risk and um, discrepancies in their balance and their stability than those that didn't have any sort of hearing issues. Um, obviously, vertigo, um, cataracts that I had mentioned, um, neuropathy that I had mentioned, um, and then any sort of like joint injury. So what I like to do is access the foot, do barefoot movement, build foot kinesthetic awareness, use Naboso insoles to put something in the hand. So hold either um, a textured ball, hypersphere makes a ball that vibrates. So have that. Um, using really kinesiology tape or rock tape and things like that, stimulate the proprioceptive system. Can that help be just another voice saying, you know, I am here? Um, there is uh, some interesting research that shows that when people walk with a cane, that they have better balance, not because it's a third point of contact, but it's because something is in their hand. So it's, it, it's a way to kind of hack the balance system by doing that. Um, the walking poles that you might see like urban polling, part of it is that it's getting the reciprocal swing, but something's in your hand. Um, Smovi, which is another product I really like. It's a, a big ring that you hold on to with your hands. You have two of them, and there are these ball bearings that are in it, and it there's ridges in it, and it vibrates. So you're holding something with weight, proprioceptive. Um, it's in your hand, proprioceptive, and then it creates vibration, proprioceptive, and then you have two of them, so it induces the reciprocal arm swing. Um, so all of those feed the balance in gait. Um, Smovy is S-M-O-V-E-Y. And I think they might call it Smovy, but I call it Smovy. Um, Urban Polling is the other one that I had mentioned that drives reciprocal. Um, those are two big products. Hypersphere is the vibrating roller. Kinesiology tape, um, you know, is the tape that stimulates the superficial fascia. Weights, this is another thing little wrist weights, wrist weights, ankle weights, stimulate the proprioceptive, proprioceptive system. A weighted vest, that stimulates the proprioceptive system. Um, so depending on where you see the greatest discrepancy, maybe if you just had um, little uh, wrist weights, that that would stimulate the reciprocal arm swing that starts to get you into the pattern and momentum of gait, which improves balance. Um, Another big thing is you have to walk at a certain pace to maintain balance. It's like riding a bicycle, that if the slower you walk or the slower you're on the bike, the chance you're just going to tip over. So we have to get into a certain pace to drive the reciprocal patterning of gait. And then when you're kind of in that momentum state, you actually have better balance, but you actually have more efficiency. You're feeding your fascial system. You start to increase blood flow. You stimulate brain-derived um, neurotrophic growth, growth factor. So you essentially growth factor for the brain. So there's all these things that people are not walking at a fast enough pace. And that in itself is, a, is an issue that I see with age. And then you just start to get these declines and unfortunately, these people, these patients are coming to me and they're like, they have whatever their chronic pain is. And they're like, Dr. Splickle, the one thing that I can still do that makes me so happy is I can walk. And I'm like, oh my God, but the way you're walking is actually feeding your problem because they're not walking fast enough. They're walking slow, little shuffled, and they have no arm swing. And they're essentially walking like this, that it's a very inefficient pattern that is technically feeding the cause of what their root problem is um which is why having 
tips and tricks like the urban polling and the smovies and the insoles and the barefoot it are really important to use and take advantage of yeah cool. good question thank you so much i asked a quick question about um rolling balls but we only have like 15 minutes left we'd love to hear too about the gut biodome and the interception You're okay such a wealth of knowledge you have so much information love it i, I just like read <laughs> i don't know <laughs> um so yeah we'll have to do another one that like continues this um because i could clearly talk about barefoot for hours and i do <laughs> in my training um so with interoception and gut because they're very they're very similar and very related I started exploring interoception when I started exploring fascia. So the fascial web that you guys are probably all very familiar with, I think of fascia as, yes, it's connective tissue, but it's sensory tissue. So your fascia is an extension of your brain is how you want to think of it. You have over 100 million sensory nerves in your fascial web. 100 million sensory nerves, which means that to feed your fascia feeds the brain, feeds vitality. Everything is built around sensory. Sensory precedes motor. Life is sensory. Movement is sensory. Naboso's slogan is life is sensory because we need to bring the stimulus in. Your fascia is another stimulus to um, different stimulation. So you could think of fascia as you know the plantar fascia your tendons that's connective tissue but now you can actually turn it into oh but now we have uh fascial receptors in your gut which is visceral fascia so visceral fascia is different than myofascia right so we can think of them similar but slightly different the the visceral fascia is very interplayed with the gut with gut feelings, uh, intuition, and interoception. Uh, so interoception is different than exteroception. Exteroception is your sensory relationship to the outside world. Barefoot is exteroception. Mechanoceptors are exteroception. So I have this external environment that I'm interacting with. I'm interacting with you guys, with the room, with the light, right? That's my external environment. But at the same time, I have an internal environment that I'm interacting with and I'm regulating and modifying my state with. And that internal environment is based off of interoceptors that respond to internal balance. Um, they regulate and help you understand uh, heart palpitations or butterflies in your stomach are interoceptors. Um, so the internal balance actually lays the foundation to the external balance. So interoceptors precede technically or lay the lens through which your exteroception is processed. Now, everybody's interoceptive awareness is different. Um, interoception awareness is how much mind body or in tune with your body are you are some of these terms that people will use. Um, the if you think of I have butterflies in my stomach and you think of it as not from a mind body connection, someone could say, I have gas or uh, I have indigestion, right? It's something what it is versus I have these butterflies, what's going on? Okay, actually, I feel that my heart rate is going a little higher. So it's just your interpretation of it. Clearly, very Western medicine is I have to assess you for IBS or something like that. Um, or non cardiac chest pain, where you feel like, okay, I have palpitations, what's happening? I have chest pain and you go and you think you're having a heart attack, that's a very Western medicine thought to it versus, oh, I'm actually feeling kind of anxious and I can sense this in my heartbeat, that's an interoception. Um, so again, it lays the foundation of internal balance to your external lens. Now, 
when you start going on to internal balance, then you open Pandora's box to the autonomic nervous system <laughs> and your ability to balance. Am I in fight or flight or rest, digest? sympathetic versus parasympathetic where are you in that scale of things um since i don't have a lot of time i'm gonna start giving you guys some things to go listen to um so there's a theory that's called polyvagal theory i don't know if anyone who's tuned in i'm sure summer has heard of it um polyvagal theory by stephen porges speaks a lot about interoception uh, internal balance and harmony, how that's interpreted through the autonomic nervous system. And it actually goes in very well that there's, there's not just one vagus nerve. Vagus is the parasympathetic rest digest, but we actually have two different pathways of how we process our internal to external states. Um, to not make it confusing, there is the sympathetic fight or flight that everyone knows, and then the parasympathetic rest digest. But that's oversimplifying the way that your body balances your internal harmony or, or equilibrium. There's actually a third state that is your freeze response. That's also a vagus nerve response. That's a reptilian response. And depending on how you interpret your level of threat, is based off of your your personal uh perception hope that makes sense so let's say that i live in new york city and my, my husband is this totally tattooed black belt martial artist wing chung blah 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 um and i you know think that butterflies are everywhere and you know life is wonderful <laughs> so completely different perspective on things Let's say we're both walking through a dark alley and he goes to a dark alley and someone's kind of comes up to him because of his background, he probably would stay in a very low level threat state, obviously going to fight or flight because that's a protective response, but he, he would be able to defend himself because he knows he has the skill. So he kind of have one interpretation to it. And then after the fight, he'd probably be like, Ooh, okay, let me go back to my baby um, where I would completely shut down and probably have a higher perceived threat level. And when it goes through fight or flight, the next level of higher threat is your freezing or your shutdown is protective. So let's say if that happened to me and I just totally, I would freeze. A lot of people freeze. That's why people freeze in traumatic states. And they're just like, uh, and like, I knew I should have done something and you just freeze because your interpretation of that threat went higher. So, um, that jumped up freezing. So that's kind of finding value. That is polyvagal theory. Now, if you get stuck in any of these states, then that goes into the next thing that you should look up, which is uh, Peter Levine's work, um, the waking the tiger. And that's going into how animals in the wild process trauma and essentially close the trauma loop. All of that is super important to your internal harmony. Because again, you might be like, Emily, what's this has to do with interoception? That's your internal harmony. Is the more that you are in touch with yourself, your interoception and the subtleties of your internal equilibrium, you could either control them or reconnect with them to change the perception with the external world. Let me give you a quick example is let's say you have an anger management problem, which I'm sure none of you do, but let's say you start getting like annoyed, right? Like you're at Starbucks. Maybe you ho hope you're at Starbucks right now and you're waiting for your coffee. It's taking too long and you're starting to like, you're starting to get pissed, right? So you feel like your blood pressure is going up. The person that's more interoceptively aware and can sense those subtleties within their internal equ equilibrium can say, well done, Emily, calm down. Like you've only been a minute waiting for your coffee. There's other people, they're busy. Life's not going to end. It's just coffee, right? And you can kind of like talk yourself down versus the person who snaps and they have no idea. They didn't even feel that they're, that they were like rising and then they just exploded and then they don't realize until they explode. So having interoceptive awareness 
is very important to emotional regulation. So the more emotionally regulated or the more emotionally flexible a person is, the more interoceptively aware they are. So they equal the same, which is essentially matched with resiliency, with um, vagal tone. If you've ever heard of the term vagal tone, vagal tone means once you go into a sympathetic spike, how quickly can you reset your back, yourself back down to parasympathetic? We all need to have a fight or flight response because it's protective, but how quickly can we bring ourselves back down to regulation? That's what vagal tone is, and that's the muscle that you want to train interoceptively and autonomic nervous system wise. Um, what does that vagal tone is parasympathetic. The parasympathetic muscle is vagal tone. Heart rate variability is the same thing. They're all interchangeable words. Um, now, because I don't have a lot of time and I'm probably over time, is to start to assess where you or your clients are interoceptively the best way to do it when you look at research is to listen to your heartbeat and count your heartbeat. So when I do workshops, I'll actually do a little a test or a game or, or an example where I have everybody lie down or they sit kind of like in a lotus pose. Your palms are up. You can't be down touching anything. Your eyes are shut and you want to sense your heartbeat. And then you count how many heartbeats you sense or you feel in 15 seconds, and then you take your hand and you go to your radio pulse, you don't move anything else, and you count what your actual heart rate is. And then you do a comparison. So of you just shutting your eyes and sensing your heart beats, does it actually match your actual heart rate? The more uh, accurate that is, the more interoceptively aware you are. Um, so you could just use that as an exercise. If someone is like, my what? what? Like, how do I feel my heartbeat if I'm not touching anything? Like, what, how do you do that? That is someone who would be decreased on the interoceptive awareness and probably, you know, flips out uh, without even realizing it. To build interoceptive awareness, that's your exercise. So at night, before you go to bed, after a workout, lay in Savasana and just Feel your heartbeat, just sense it and feel it and connect with your heartbeat. Um, builds interoceptive awareness. Meditation does, of course. Mind body practices do. Yoga, Tai Chi, anything that's connecting to the to the to the body is technically building internal interoceptive awareness. Um, last thing to kind of tie into it is typically people who have low interoceptive awareness have low exteroceptive awareness. So this would be someone who, let's say maybe they have depression, like clinical depression, and they don't really feel or connect to their internal body. Posturally, they might not realize that they're standing like this, right? Be like, why are you standing like that? Why are you hanging your head down and your shoulders are slumped forward? They probably don't feel that exteroceptively in their joint capsules and connective tissue that, oh, when I stand like this, oh, wh what does that feel like exteroceptively, right? Now, what does that feel like interoceptively? Oh, you know what? I actually feel like happier or a little bit different as far as, right? So there's this dance between interoceptive and exteroceptive. I find this in all <laughs> of my chronic pain, chronic movement dysfunction patients is there is a huge emotional, physical interplay and a disassociation from the interoception, which transmits further into their disconnect exteroceptively. Whew. Hope that made <laughs> Previous question about that, um, related to our energetic centers or, or chakras, if you will. So we teach here at the Flow Shuttle, we educate all of our clients on the um, somatic centers from a non-dogmatic viewpoint, basically concentrated nerve ganglia around seven points of the spine. Would you say that um, cultivating an awareness of your energetic centers through meditation and um, through, I guess, mindfulness practices and breath work would be helpful for, for increasing and improving your interoception score? Yes, um, absolutely. And what I find really interesting is I love to mix 
East and Western philosophies where the way that I'm speaking of interoception, even though it's a mind body connection and it's somatic and it's uh, emotional, it's still kind of within a Western approach. So try to find the blending of the languages, try to find some of the research like Eastern research and Western research. They're saying the same thing. They're using slightly different words, but the end result is ultimately the same. Amazing. All right. So we have like one minute till 11. <laughs> what questions do you guys have for Dr. Emily while she's here? I know I saw Celine asked one, Dr. Emily, she said, a concrete, my house was a concrete floor. I walk my dog every day, but on the concrete sidewalk, what would you recommend for rewilding the foot, the insoles? Question mark. And I wrote, uh, there, sorry. So I wrote yes. a message below, but I wasn't sure if that was. Okay. okay. Yeah. So um, if you have a house in concrete um, or marble, like a lot of people actually have granite floors or marble floors, um, and then you're walking on concrete is excessive concrete. You do actually want to have some, some sort of cushion in your shoe, which seems very counter to what I said. So the counter or the cushion is offsetting the concrete, but then it's disconnecting you from the proprioceptive input or the mechanoceptor input from the foot. So then, yes, that's where you could add in the Naboso insoles and then make sure that you're bringing in other barefoot movement, um, whether that's through your, your practice that you're doing on a hardwood floor. Make sure you're going outside and earthing. I know I didn't mention that at all, but earthing, you know, walking on the grass and getting connection to nature so that you're off of this um, artificial concrete surface. Uh, on concrete cushion, yes, that offset some of the vibration, bring a stimulus into the shoe that would be Naboso, get off of the concrete every day if you can and get a small dose of natural surface grass um, dirt, that would be the earthing that allows you to reconnect to the natural rhythm and harmony of the planet, circadian rhythms, um, reduces free radicals, increases the immune system, so a lot of benefits to earthing. Any other questions, guys? Cool. All right, so thank you guys so much for coming in. If there's any other questions, feel free to type them into the chat bar on the, on the right. Um, if you're curious and you wanna get yourself a Naboso Technology mat, you are welcome to do so at nabosotechnology.com. If you wanna take 10% off, I'm an ambassador, so you can take 10% off using my code, SEMMERH. And um, you, if you want to learn more about Dr. Emily's work, you can go to uh, at EFBA. Uh, e okay, I'm gonna write it here. Uh, yeah. www.efba. Sorry, no, EB. <laughs> okay, okay. E Fitnessacademy.com. Yes. Cool, and then Ruthie says, do foot calluses hinder feedback through the feet? They actually do not. There was a research study that just came out showing that that calluses do not reduce sensory input through the feet. So that's totally fine. Um, although you should try to keep calluses uh, as debrided as possible, not because of the sensory, but it actually contributes to foot pain. So it could be an underlying cause of some excess pressure. Awesome, all right. So double thumbs up if you learned something during this talk, yeah. I can't tell. I hope there's some thumbs up. <laughs> if you swipe to the right, you'll be able to see everyone in gallery view. Hi, Wendy. Oh, look at that. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank cool. you guys for spending time with me. Yeah, for sure. All right. So this will be recorded. I'll share it on my YouTube, Summer Huntington. Feel free to follow me there. I've been putting up a lot of free classes there. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Emily. It's a pleasure to have you here at the Flow Shala Virtual Studio. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'll be here um, just filtering, asking any questions if anyone has questions. Um, and those of us new to the studio, look for an email. You'll get a survey to rate your experience and you get a free class if you fill out that survey. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Stop recording.